This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD 229, MRI Signals and Sequences, offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The seventh lecture on signal-to-noise ratio is divided into three parts. Lecture 7b covers SNR factors and relationships. The learning objectives are to write relations for propagation of Gaussian statistics through linear combinations, to explain qualitatively the relationships between SNR and types of coil and positioning, to explain how SNR changes with forms of averaging due to scan parameters, and to define and calculate signal-to-noise ratio efficiency. Let us first look at Gaussian noise and averaging. So let us first start with a set of Gaussian random variables x sub n. These have a mean of 0 and some parameter sigma. We can take an average as a simple sum, which is a weighted sum here, where the weights are a sub n and the random variables are x sub n. If we do this, the variances are also averaged by those same weights. So the overall variance of this sum will simply be the sum of the weights times the variance. The standard deviation is sigma sub sum, so this is the square root of the overall variance. So most commonly, we might take an average of two random variables, simply one half of the sum of those random variables, and in this case, the average sigma will be the sigma reduced by the square root of two. There are many forms of averaging in MRI. We can acquire an image twice, often referred to as two averages or two necks. We can increase the number of phasing code lines. We can do this by increasing resolution, but notice this will reduce signal as we'll talk about later. Or you can increase the field of view and this will reduce the noise. You can increase the acquisition time or A to D time you can reduce the readout bandwidth and keep the resolution the same. And you can use multiple channels. And this is another form of averaging which is more complicated and will be dealt with in the next lecture. So let's start with a question. Compared to a 128 by 128 image, a 256 by 256 image with twice the field of view in both directions and the same readout bandwidth has which of these SNR relationships? So the answer here is E, because you gain a square root of two because you have twice the number of phasing code lines. So you've done a simple average with a factor of two, and then you gain an additional square root of two because you have doubled the A to D time here. So both these give you a square root of two, so overall you get twice the SNR. Notice that the pixel size did not change and increasing the field of view itself does not change the signal to noise ratio. So now let's look at signal dependencies. The signal, as we saw in the last lecture, depends on the signal level, which is due to polarization and relaxation. It depends on the coil sensitivity at that pixel and it depends on the voxel volume, and in fact is proportional to the voxel volume. So there's actually a fundamental trade-off of SNR versus resolution versus scan time, and this is shown here. In the middle is the equation that again agrees with the last lecture, that the signal-to-noise ratio is proportional to the voxel volume and the square root of the A to D time, the total A to D time. Now, when we look at this relationship, we can see that we are always competing between high signal to noise ratio at the top, sharp images or high resolution at the bottom left, and fast scans on the right. And this is a fundamental trade-off in MR, but notice that things like the coils, the field strength, the pulse sequence, and other factors will affect the starting point here. So we want to get these right, and then we will have this trade-off. So let's look at another question to review this. What is the effect of the SNR of doubling the phasing code field of view and scan time? 
of reducing the readout bandwidth and gradient by two, of doubling the readout length and having the pixel size. So let's look at these one at a time. So first, you get a square root of two increase in SNR because you've simply, by doubling the field of view, you double the total A to D time here and you haven't changed the pixel size. So that is a change in the total acquisition time. In B, we get a square root of two increase in SNR as well because we've reduced the readout bandwidth and we've reduced the gradient by two, which means we've doubled the A to D time. So we have a square root of two increase. In C, we get a square root of two decrease in the noise because we've doubled the readout length. But now if we've cut the, the pixel size in two, we get a two X decrease in signal. So overall, we get a square root of two decrease in the signal to noise ratio here. So now let's talk about the concept of SNR efficiency. And the point of this is we often want to compare the signal to noise ratio of different sequences that might have different parameters. So if the times of these sequences differ, we can normalize this comparison or make it fair by using the signal to noise efficiency. And this is defined as eta SNR is equal to SNR divided by the square root of the total scan time. So in many cases, the total scan time is proportional to TR, and you can often write this efficiency uh, as SNR divided by the square root of TR, but you should be careful doing this with different sequences. So to illustrate this, let's look at a question. So let's compare the SNR efficiency of two pulse sequences, assuming that the signal level is constant. In the first sequence, we have a spin echo train. We acquire eight echoes using a 32.25 kilohertz bandwidth, and the repetition time here is 100 milliseconds. If we look at the SNR efficiency of this, we see that the SNR efficiency here is proportional to eight, the square root of eight over 32.25 times 100, and this is equal to 0 0.05, okay? And notice that inside the square root here, the eight is effectively because the scan, the acquisition time is multiplied by eight because we acquire eight echoes and we divide by the square root of the bandwidth and we divide by the square root of the TR because of the SNR efficiency uh, calculation. We can also look at a simple gradient echo sequence with a higher bandwidth, but a shorter TR here. And now we see that the SNR efficiency here is proportional to one over the bandwidth times the TR, and all of this is under a square root, and this gives us 0.057. So it's interesting here to see that the SNR efficiency in both cases is actually quite similar. The SNR efficiency of the spin echo sequence is enhanced by the fact that we have eight echoes and we have a lower bandwidth, but it is penalized by the longer TR time. Now notice that the signal level would not be constant, so this calculation does get a little bit more difficult in practice, but hopefully this uh, example illustrates how you can have two somewhat different sequences with a very similar SNR efficiency. Now let's look at, at the signal, and if we look at the SNR with different voxel sizes, these are just some examples. You see a full high resolution image on the left. If we increase the voxel uh, volume by a factor of two and do this over three axes, you see that the SNR improves here. Essentially the noise level goes down. You can see a little bit of blurring of features because the resolution has uh, been made more coarse. And then on the right, if you increase the voxel size by a factor of four, you get even more SNR improvement here. Notice now you get a bit of a projection through some of these small vessels here because the slices are thicker. Okay, so this shows you again that the SNR will go up proportionally with voxel size, or at least that it goes up with voxel size. Now, if we look at field strength, in the last lecture, you saw that the signal to noise is proportional to the Larmor frequency. Well, here are two images acquired at 1.5T and 3T. 
and the signal to noise ratio at 3t is almost twice as high as that of 1.5t. It turns out that it's not quite as high because there's a longer t1 time at 3t, and in the sequences there's some saturation effect. But again, higher field strength usually means higher polarization and higher signal. Now let's look at the noise. If we look at the SNR and subject size and position, we see here with a large subject versus a small subject. In the large subject, there's actually greater noise. And this is simply because there is more uh, loss in the coil uh, because the subject is, is uh, essentially there's, there's more body noise, if you will, in the coil. And on the right, you have a smaller background noise. Now notice also on the left, the subject's actually closer to the coil, is filling the coil more. So uh, at the back of the knee here, you see a very bright signal. So you see this quite high signal near the coil. So we can look a bit at the signal and the noise when we think about the coil sensitivity. Now this is a bit of a simplification, but these concepts are important. So first of all, small coils are often more sensitive when you're at the surface of the object. The noise volume increases with the coil size. So a larger coil will be sensitive to noise from a larger volume. And third, as we'll see in the next lecture, smaller coils can limit the field of view. They, they can limit the aliasing and they can allow us uh, to image uh, more efficiently. Now, if we look at the size of this coil here, we can choose some surface element here and the coil has some sensitive volume here. And essentially you want to think about the, the target region that you're trying to image, in this case might be the, the head of the hip, uh, the humeral head. And you want to think about the fact that larger coils have a larger sensitive depth or more penetration. So if you're imaging very near the surface, smaller coils will do very well. But if you want to image deeper, you'll lose the advantage of having smaller coil elements. The other coil consideration that's very important historically is the, the comparison between a linear coil and quadrature coils or phased array coils. So if you have a simple linear birdcage coil, if you first go to a quadrature coil, you should get about a square root two improvement in uh, SNR. Um, and phased array coils will do similarly or even better than, uh, quad than quadrature coils. So you see here a dramatic improvement in signal to noise ratio between uh, two coil arrays, or sorry, two coils, a linear extremity coil versus a phased array coil with exactly the same sequence parameters here. So this brings us to another question. Which of the following will usually result in an increase in SNR at the surface? And you can choose more than one of these answers. So please look through all answers here. Okay. So the correct answers here are, in fact, four of these. So A, C, D, and E are all correct here. So smaller subjects and smaller coils will generally result in less noise. So this gives you A being correct and C being correct. Smaller coils are more sensitive. Um, quadrature coils ideally will give you a square root two more SNR. So D is also correct. And higher field strength will increase polarization. And this will almost always increase the signal. So this is why E is correct as well. Notice that in F, a stronger gradient may shorten the echo time. So this may give you a higher signal because of less T2 or T2 star decay. But it also shortens the A to D time. And this usually dominates in terms of SNR. So as with many things in MRI, it's very difficult to give an absolute generalization. So let's uh, finally look at a topic of non-uniform sampling. This is a very simple case, but it's important to see how this affects the signal to noise ratio. So we've already seen how we can average an image by acquiring all of the case space twice. But what if we sample half of the case space uh, lines twice and the other half just once? So these lines will then be averaged in order to reconstruct an image reasonably. So in this case, we've sampled the inner half of K-space uh, twice. 
So what you see here is that there's lower noise because of averaging in the middle part of k-space than in the outer part of k-space. In fact, the noise is, just, is reduced by this number here. So we've basically taken the square root of the uh, overall variance here, of the noise here. So we've got uh, a half because that's the outer half, and then in the middle half we've got a half times a half because we've reduced the variance by a factor of two by this averaging here. So this gives us a square root of three quarters. But notice the acquisition time is increased by a factor of 1.5. So overall, the efficiency has actually dropped by a factor of a square root of eight ninths. Now you might look at that and say, well, that's close to one, so there hasn't been much of a change. But this is just an, an example to illustrate what happens here. We can look at this histogram, and actually what you see here is the red line fit here is slightly smaller than the the, than the actual data here. And that's because the red line fit is showing what would happen if you didn't lose this SNR efficiency. So we've actually got a slightly higher noise, uh, about 5% higher by uh, doing this sampling here. And then finally, the noise is, not, is colored now, it's non-white. It's actually very difficult to see in the images with this example, but then there's actually more noise in the higher frequencies. We'll see other examples later with different sampling trajectories where we see this concept again. But for now, it's just important to note that non-uniform sampling will affect and almost always decrease the SNR efficiency. So in summary for this lecture, so in summary from this lecture, there are many forms of averaging that result in a square root n improvement in SNR. There's a fundamental SNR trade-off that SNR is proportional to the voxel volume times the square root of the acquisition time. SNR efficiency is SNR normalized by the square root of the scan time. SNR usually improves with smaller coil elements and with quadrature versus linear coils and with higher field strength. SNR efficiency is reduced with non-uniform sampling. So the next question might be, how is SNR affected by the use of multiple coils? And we'll see this in Lecture 7C.